for it. All right, folks. Um, I am Michael Bonclear, and I'm going to be talking about Carolingian legend. Um, medieval, the stories that medieval people told each other, they themselves broke down into what we call the three matters. Uh, the matter of Britain, which is Arthurian legend, Arthur, his court, the rise and fall of Camelot, and the couple of generations uh, before uh, the birth of Arthur. And um, I think there are a few uh, stories immediately after um, fall. So that, that is the matter of Britain. The matter of Britain is um, very mystical. There's a lot of magic. Um, the uh, supernatural creatures uh, involve themselves in the affairs of humans, um, and it was it was the most high fantasy of the the great matters of stories that medieval people told each other. The the third matter is the matter of Rome, that was what they called it, and that is all of the ancient epics, um, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid. Um, but also uh, all these metamorphoses, uh, we didn't have, or they did not have Ovid directly, I don't believe, but they had all of the stories involved in the metamorphoses. Uh, the Romance of Alexander, if you're familiar with um, that great work, we get a lot of illuminations, wonderful illuminations from the Romance of Alexander. But the, the second matter, and perhaps the most influential to medieval people themselves, was the matter of France. And that was the legends that grew up surrounding um, Carolus Magnus, Charlemagne. Um, now, these things happen in a funny way. Uh, so the way I'm going to introduce this to you is by starting out and providing a broad overview of the historical context of where we were in history, what Charlemagne's life looked like, and then I'll talk about the legends that grew out of it because they have, there are, there are surprising parallels between what really happened or what might have really happened and what shows up in the legends. But the legends are all over the place. Um, so Charlemagne um, was not known as Charlemagne in his life. That, let's get that out of the way. He was Carl. Um, actually, if he were to say it himself, it would probably be Carl. He would enunciate the two vowels separately, Carl. Um, uh, so you can see how the Latin come, becomes Carolus. Um, he was Carolus Rex or Carolus Magnus. And um, Carolus became the English Charles um, and the French uh, French has actually gone through uh, multiple transformations in, uh, I mean, you, you think about the difference between Old English and Modern English and how Modern English has softened and the diction has changed. French has gone through an even more radical transformation than that. So their Carl has become Charlet. Um, and, uh, this was going on in the late 700s AD. So the late eighth century. It is over 300 years since the fall of Rome. But Rome didn't really fall. It was occupied by, by barbarians. The, the barbarian kingdoms were all military, militarily proficient, um, usually feudally organized peoples who admired Rome. They did. Uh, they had little tolerance for Rome's politics um, and the niceties of civil society, but every single one of them wanted their children educated by Romans. They wanted their laws to look like Roman laws. They wanted their cities built like Roman cities. And the further away we get from 
Roman citizenry shaping their own destiny. Um, and the further towards we get, the further towards, um, I will speak inelegantly and say, ruled by barbarians, um, the, the more distant that dream got. Um, everyone wanted the restoration of Rome. They were hoping for a revival of Rome. The church hoped for it. The people of Italy hoped for it. The people of Gallia, now Francia, hoped for it. They all wanted that back. They wanted stability. Um, they wanted the purpose uh, that comes from empire. Uh, at that time, the Franks were the undisputed masters of Roman Gaul. Um, they had defeated the Avars and driven them off to the east. Um, they were ruled by the Merovingians. Um, the Merovingians were the descendants of King Merovic. Um, actually, he was probably the real ruler. But um, just like the Carolingians are not descendants of Charlemagne, they're descendants of Charles Martel, who was the mayor of France, or the mayor of Paris, uh, and the power behind the front. They called him the uh, uh, ducks at princeps. Um, Charles Martel um, is most notable for defeating the Muslim invasion of Tours. Um, this was when uh, Islam was both militant and ascendant, and they were not content to stop with the Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. Um, there are, and we will get into them as we discuss the legends that were built off of these events. There are many raids on mainland Europe, far deeper than you might expect. There was uh, a raid on Rome itself, and St. Peter's Basilica was sacked. Of course, it looked very different than it does now. But yes, it was sacked. Uh, there was a siege of Paris. There was the, the Great Battle of Tours, of course. And almost every village near the Mediterranean um, has history of, of raids across the Mediterranean. It, it did vary on who did it, whether it was the Libyans, um, whether it was the Spaniards, whether it was the Turks, whether it was the Saracens. Um, but those, those raids became um, a fixture in the medieval mind, even hundreds of years later. Um, Carl Charlemagne was born the son of Pippin the Short. Pippin was the first king of the Franks, um, or the first Carolingian king of the France, Franks. He was already the mayor of the palace, the dux et princeps. He wrote a letter to the Pope saying, um, is it really all right that France is ruled by, Francia, as it was called then, is ruled by um, a puppet king, a placeholder king, someone who holds ceremonial high office but has no real authority. Is this really all right? Um, and the Pope said, actually, no. If you would like to do something about that, I think we would be fine with that. So he did. He deposed the last Merovingian king and crowned himself um, king of France. And I believe he was crowned by Bishop Eligius. Um, he later became Saint Eligius, but it might have been his predecessor. I'm not sure on that one. Um, and uh, Pippin, uh, uh, he had a brother. Uh, he drove his brother into a monastery so that the kingdom was not divided. And that will be a theme here. Um, he had two sons to inherit the throne. Uh, one was Charles. Uh, the other was um, Carloman was his name. Um, let me get my timeline here. Um, so when Nope, I'll talk about that later. When Carl Moon and 
Charles are crowned kings of France. They are really elected by the army. Um, Charles uh, marries Desiderata, who is the daughter of the king of the Lombards and divorces her immediately. Um, his life is marked by, uh, I think, five political marriages uh, of women who become his queen. And he has, I think, seven known concubines. Uh, I think there are seven or eight children that are known to us. This was not at a time where um, the Christian church was prepared to uh, make a stand on the um, barbaric, barbarian practice of polygamy. They, they, that would come in about 200 years, or no, no, two generations, uh, largely due to the efforts of Charlemagne. But um, that wasn't a thing yet. Uh, uh, no, I take that back. Polygamy, they did take a stand on. But uh, the practice of taking of concubinage, of taking concubines, um, they, were, they weren't prepared to tackle that one yet. Um, Charles conducted campaigns against the Kingdom of Lombardy. Lombardy is northern Italy. Uh, he conducted campaigns against the Saxons in uh, western Germany. Um, and then he famously conducted campaigns in Spain. Uh, now, his Spanish campaign was not long into his, into his reign. It's perhaps 10 years into his reign? Yes, I think about 10 years. He was about 36 when he campaigned in Spain. And the tale of his army was famously ambushed by uh, Muslim Basques. Um, God, Basques are fascinating. We'll talk about that also a little bit later. Um, and that became, that, that incident was Charles's only military defeat and that grew into the Song of Roland. Um, he had a long campaigning history ahead of him. That's not the end. He goes on to conquer Germany. He eliminates the Avars as a, basically as a culture group um, and creates the Ostreich, Austria. Uh, by eliminating the Avars, he unites uh, the largest European empire since the fall of Rome. Um, and at the, towards the end of his life, in I think 800 AD, um, he was invited to Rome by Pope Urban? No, Pope Leo. By Pope Leo, his crowned emperor of the Romans. Um, yeah, he calls, uh, crowns him Holy Roman Emperor, and Charles uh, then takes off both crown his dad, King of Franks, and he crowns that off to his oldest son. And then his second oldest son, he crowns King of Italy. Um, and you would think that there would be these separate kingdoms, but Charles outlived almost all of his progeny. The only one who was left um, was um, his son, Louis. Louis. Um, I say Louis specifically because the name Louis or Lewis, um, was taken from the Frankish name Clovis. You've heard of, of Clovis, King Clovis. Uh, I think he was one of the first uh, successful Merovingian kings. The name Clovis lives on today as Lewis or Louis. Um, so you can tell from the names that existed before uh, how the names of this time were likely pronounced and observe how much they, they, they change over time. Um, when Charlemagne died, uh, he was 68 years old. Uh, he 
handed off the empire to his only surviving legitimate son who maintained its integrity, Louis the Pious. And then within three generations, the kingdom fractured because um, every parent wants to, or, well, not every, almost every parent wants to divide what they have equally among their children who can receive it. And that led, um, and that has always been the problem with the poor kingdoms. That's been a problem with Poland. That was a problem with Wales. That was a problem in uh, Scotland sometime, in Ireland often. Um, the Franks learned from the shattering of the kingdom. And in Western Francia, which became France, um, they developed the process, the, uh, the custom of primogeniture. Uh, that first son gets it all. And uh, the second son has to fight for what's his, and the third goes to the church. That's pretty much how it went from there. But so that's the shape of the world in Charlemagne's time. Uh, there were no Frenchmen, there were no, uh, there were Germans, uh, the Germanians, there were Franks, there were Germanians, there were Saxons, there were Danes, there were Lombards, there were Gascons, there were Basques. Um, France, as we understand it, was not a thing. The French, as we understand them, were not a thing. So when I speak of Carolingian legend, to differentiate the historical Charlemagne from the Charlemagne in legend, I'm going to call the legendary figure Carl or Carl and Agnes. Um, I do that because Carl and Agnes is the, there's actually a saga, a Carl and Agnes saga it was written in Sweden, it comes from all of the other sagas, and it is the most complete and organized retelling of the numerous legends surrounding Charlemagne into one cohesive story. Uh, the matter of Britain, Arthur's stories, we owe our understanding of the kind of timeline of Arthur's life to Thomas Mallory, who wrote The Mort to Arthur. Um, and to, to a significant extent, to T.H. White, who wrote The Once and Future King. Um, between the two of them, we have a very good mental grasp on the events of, of Arthurian Britain, the uh, what happened before Arthur, Arthur's birth and the growth of the kingdom, the golden age, um, the fall and dissolution of the kingdom. We, we have that arc organized for us thanks to Thomas Mallory and thanks to an unnamed Swedish monk who created the, who wrote down the saga for us, we have that for Charlemagne as well. But um, these things haven't made their way into English. Um, uh, an interesting historical footnote about the Carl and Agnes saga was the author had to write a just so story to explain why Carl and Agnes had two first names. You see, Carl, that's a name. We still have that name. It was in common parlance then. But Sorry, earthquake. Uh, but Magnus entered the Scandinavian le lexicon as a name in imitation of Charlemagne. The Charlemagne was Carolus Magnus. They took the Latin and they said, well, it looks like a good name to me. Um, I don't remember, was it started by King Magnus? I think it was. Um, Oh, he had a second name, and I don't remember what it was. But anyway, he named himself royally Magnus um, because, well, he wanted to live his life in imitation of Charlemagne. Didn't quite work that way. But it, it, it made that a first name, that entered the Scandinavian lexicon. Magnus is still a perfectly acceptable name um, in any of the Scandinavian countries today. A 
funny thing happened though, they didn't look to Latin to say, well, Magnus means great. Right? We coming with, with a closer linguistic, uh, with li closer linguistic ties to Latin, it, it, it's right there for us. Uh, but they looked to their own language. They, it was, uh, uh, what is it called, folk etymology? Yeah. Um, uh, Magen Hus is uh, old Icelandic for basically means powerhouse. So Magnus, Magen Hus, oh, uh, that's, that's a good name. It, it makes a lot more sense when you have a language in which people were routinely calling themselves like Thunder Bear and Moon Wolf. Um, That's the, the, the literal translation of those names. So powerhouse, yeah, sure, why not? Uh, so the uh, the author had to explain to the audience why does Charlemagne have two first names? And so uh, in one of those the stories where oh, I wonder if there was something there. Um, the story goes it's the story of Basin the Thief uh, or the the chanson. He, what what follows? What I'm going to do is tell you. Um, I'm going to to introduce you to some of the oldest chansons I know of the figures of Charlemagne's court. And we're going to start with Charlemagne himself. So um, he had a song, a chanson, a uh, chanson de Basin, I think. Um, Basin spelled like a Saint Basin. Um, <clears throat> The story goes that after Pippin died, an angel came to Charlemagne and said, uh, your life is in danger. You should probably clear out. Go to, uh, go to the Ardon. Uh, the, uh, the forest of the Ardon was a uh, remnant of the original Black Forest that covered Europe from corner to corner. Um, there are pockets of these primeval forests scattered all over Europe. Um, they have all been logged over, um, but they are still old growth forests. And the Arden, the Argonne, um, uh, Schwarzwald, um, were all big, much bigger than they are now, but in the same geographic location. So they said, Essentially, because the, the Ardan is uh, between France and Belgium in uh, north, north central France. Uh, the angel said, go there and search out Basin the Thief and then uh, become a bandit. Um, so Charlemagne was a little distressed at the uh, instruction from a heavenly messenger to take up a life of sin. What's, what's going on here? So he he goes to a bishop. Uh, I think his name was like Bishop Rennie, and uh, says, uh, "What's going on here?" And the, the bishop said, "Well, obviously your life is in danger. So let's search out the, the person that the the angel told you to find, and we'll work from there." So he finds Basin the Thief, who is a famous, not a Robin Hood figure. He was a thief. A a bad man, um, who uh, in some chansons was depicted as a clever man, a, a cunning man. He had magical art to him, and that's how he was such a good thief. So uh, Charlemagne finds Basin and uh, says, "Hey, we're gonna be we're gonna be buddies now. I'm 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 with you." And the thief says, "Well, uh, okay, if an angel said so." Uh, but you can't use your name because everyone that's out for you, so you're going to have to come up with a pseudonym. And so uh, Carl picked Magnus. He, I'll, I'll, I'll be Magnus. Okay, so we are Basin and Magnus, brothers in crime. And one of the first marks that they, they underwent was the... Uh, the home of a uh, one of one of Pippin's counts, who ought to be loyal to 
Carl, but you know, maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. Um, let me see if I can find his name. Uh, Renfrey. It was Earl Renfrey. So they go to this guy's hall and they decide to knock it over. And so Basin says, I got this. And he uses his magical arts to set everyone in the house to sleep. And he finds the treasure and he robs all of their silver. And so he goes back and he, you know, pats his sidekick on the shoulder and he's like, let's get out of here. And Carl Magnus now says, okay, I, that's what you've done. Let's my turn now. Well, let's see how I do. And Basin's like, ah, um, not sure this is the best idea, but uh, Charlemagne was a impetuous. So he goes in and he does it anyway. And he um, he finds Earl Renfrey's sword in their bedchamber. But then he hears someone coming. And so quick, he runs under the bed. And, and I've knocked you all over again. I'm very, very, very sorry. Um, maybe I will switch my video input so that I don't keep knocking over my audience. Sorry. Let me see if I can switch this video input. Okay, it's, I won't knock you over this way. Um, so, um, Charlemagne is caught in the bedroom by the Earl and his lady, and he's under the bed, and they begin having a conversation together, and Renfrey is kind of boasting to his wife, like, I'm going to be king, and uh, this, is, this is interesting news to Charlemagne, so, or Magnus at the time. And uh, so he's talking to his wife, and he unveils his evil plan that he and 12 other uh, nobles are going to, uh, they've purchased 12 black daggers, and they're going to wait for the oath of fealty at Charlemagne's court coronation. And each one of them is going to stab Charlemagne, and um, then they'll have their they're all their whole retinues with them and between the 12 of them they will have the greatest number of uh, soldiers present and so they will all elect him Renfrey as the new king this was not in fact all that different than what Pippin had done to become king himself so the doggy dog world um, but Renfrey's wife says uh, you know, that, that's kind of a horrible plan because you are what you are because uh, Pippin gave you what you have. So you would think that you would be loyal to his son out of loyalty to him. And Renfrey doesn't like that at all. And so he backhands his wife, strikes her across the mouth, and she bleeds from the nose. But because they're in the bedroom, uh, she falls across the bed and she doesn't want to get blood on the sheets. And so she leans over the bed until her nose stops bleeding. And Charlemagne actually has his glove and he catches some of her blood in his glove um, as while he's under the bed and they go away and he, uh, Charlemagne is finally able to leave. Um, Basin is very nervous, obviously, um, but he's got Renfrey's sword and Basin's like, come on, let's get out of here. Um, I've got a horse and Magnus now, it's like, I think I should have a horse too. And so he takes Renfrey's horse. So um, with this knowledge, he returns to um, to his mother, Queen Bertha, I think her name was, um, and his sisters, and the Archbishop of uh, Reims, Reims. I'm going to I'm going to butcher the French. And honestly, I think that more than anything else is why Carolingian legend is largely unknown to us because French is spelled by committee and it's impenetrable to us Anglos. What is this? So I'm going to consciously prefer to use uh, the Germanic versions of names so that they are more 
uh, comfortable to we Germanic language speakers. So he goes to uh, his, his mother, the Archbishop of Rhymes, and says, uh, I uncovered a conspiracy. What should we do about it? And uh, the first thing they say is, all right, let's go grab um, the, the son of the Duke of son of the Duke of Bavaria is a very clever man. His name is, and now we want run into one of the problems, another problem with Carolingian legend. His name, the name that most people would be familiar with is probably Naaman. Um, Duke Naaman was kind of, if you're familiar with the Iliad, Nestor. Okay, the the older fellow from a previous generation is very wise, still martially competent, but is more useful for his advice than his sword arm. Okay, so they say go get him. He's the the son of the old Duke of Bavaria, and so they do. Um, I I let's talk a little bit more about Naaman. Everybody's got a, a gazillion names. Their naming is not consistent here. One of the, the boons to Arthurian legend is there's Arthur, Lancelot, Galahad, Percival. But is it is it Percival or is it Parzival? Are they two different people? Hmm. Uh, there's there's Kay, there's Ector, there's um, the there's Morgan Le Fay. But, but is Morgan Le Fay the same person or a different person than Morgana? Is Morgana the Lady of the Lake, or is it Morgan Le Fay by a different name? That problem times a thousand is Carolingian legend. So Naaman goes by name, name is, Nemo, Nemo, which is awesome. He's Duke Nemo. That's cool. Um, but name is, so, but I think of him as Duke Nemo. But if you're trying to research any of this on the web, go with Naaman. That's that's probably the most common one, N-A-I-M-O-N. Um, but anyway, so they, they grab him, who is a figure meant to be in his early middle age, maybe 40-ish, while Charlemagne is a little bit younger, um, uh, probably late 20s when this is happening. Um, and it, and Naaman says, okay, we'll get my dad, uh, we'll get your mother's brother, we'll write to the Pope, and uh, we'll get uh, a couple of our buddies, and we will break the plot because we know who the conspirators are. Uh, we'll just make sure that our friends have enough troops there that they can equal or outnumber the conspirators' troops, and then we'll will essentially break the plot by charging the ambush. And so that's what they do. And uh, then in, in, in the, the Carl Magna saga, there's chapters of, well, this person goes over here and talks to these people and these nobles and all their retinues, and they come. And then this person goes over here and talks to this person and this person is his friend. And this person happened to be there that day. And so they bring all of their retinues and some of them were uh, this family and this family. And do you see where this is going? This is like the Iliad, you know, the book of ships where the entire Greek world afterwards is like, ah, my town was from, um, was founded by this hero who was on that ship, who was in the book of lists in the Iliad. So we have, we have relevance, we have historicity with us. That's what all of France was doing with this stuff. So you will occasionally run across lists upon lists upon lists. And, well, I don't care, it doesn't drive the plot, why do you? Well, because they cared very much because someone with a, a crest that wasn't quartered very much said, I, my ancestor was there. My ancestor was that person who's in this list in this epic. So that's, that's some of what goes on. And that's, that's some of why these things were written in the first place, because they were recorded by people who felt they had a personal connection to this archaic history. Whether it was real or not, doesn't matter. 
they felt they had a connection to it. Um, and so that's that's what they do. That's how the plot goes. Um, that they write to all of their their allies. Um, they show up, and eventually, when the oaths are to be taken, um, they surround the twelve conspirators, and uh, Carl calls them out by name. Oh, 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 oh! Why he has two first names? Why he has two first names before he is allowed to be coronated? The archbishop, um, may get, get, the archbishop confirms him. You know, the confirmation is that you are now an adult. So he is confirmed. But because he has assumed a, um, a pseudonym, the archbishop confirms him under both names. So he is not just Carl. He is now Carl and Magnus. So the actions that he took as Magnus can then be legitimate. So because it's very important the king not actually be a thief because if he took these these actions as sovereign that he took his sword the the sword and the war horse of someone who is plotting against the throne right and if 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 that was done legitimately as sovereign well that then the king is not a thief the king can't be a thief right a, a thief is a, is a commoner a, 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 a king cannot steal from his subject how would that how would that look so uh, the archbishop confirmed carl carl magnus with two first names explaining how he became carl magnus to a population in scandinavia who did not recognize that carl magnus was carolus magnus charles the great they thought it was billy bob um and so um Carl is crowned Carl Magnus, king of the Franks. And uh, then as he is receiving the oaths, he calls up the conspirators by name. And they're seized and their sleeves are pulled up and the black daggers are in uh, wrist sheaths. And they're, they're disarmed and um, they are they're then executed. But um, the Earl Renfrey, the, the head conspirator, says, uh, you don't have any proof. How dare you? You don't have any proof. The knives prove nothing. We're, we just wanted to be armed. And so um, Carl Magnus goes and he takes the sword and he says, do you recognize this? This is your sword. He takes the glove and says, do you recognize this? This is the blood from your wife and you struck her across the face in your bedroom when you confessed the whole conspiracy. I was there and I heard you. And uh, Renfrey says, uh, how is it possible? A king cannot be a thief. You're a thief. You're nothing but a thief. And so uh, Charlemagne ignores him and has them executed. And the uh, their military contingent is they're surrounded by other military contingents. And they're very upset that their lords are being executed. But the plan is revealed and other great lords decide that they will, they'll take a unit from here and they'll take a unit from there. And these men will be their men now. And by disrupting the cohesion of the unit, the kingdom is now safe and Charlemagne is king. So that was based on the saga. It's a pretty good story. It's not bad. So that was the first the first chanson and the first of the three great arts of Carolingian legend. And there are three arcs of Carolingian legend. The first is, um, I think they're called Chanson de Roi, Songs of the King, where Charlemagne himself um, is the central or heroic figure, where it is the king uh, fighting off threats to the kingdom, or fighting to expand the kingdom, or fighting to for the cause or the preservation of Christianity against outside threats. That's what those songs are. So this was the first song, their songs, first story, the Shan song, in that thematic arc. The second arc is, um, and I forget the, the French name of it, but these are the songs of the 
songs of the warriors trying to make a name for themselves. Okay, so they are broadly under Charlemagne's service, but they are going on adventures trying to advance themselves in this new world that Charlemagne has created um, successfully, basically. And then the third arc is, uh, do they call it the, the Songs of the Lords? I think they might. But these are, are stories where um, lords do not fit well into this new world that Charlemagne has created. And they are either being dispossessed by more powerful lords or they are being unjustly pursued by the king. So they become rebels. And the story is of their rebellion and hopefully eventual um, resolution with the king. And often in these, they were written as um, veiled political commentary, where so Charlemagne is often made to seem um, callous and cruel in this arc of stories. Um, Why don't we take a short break here and give everybody a chance to clear up any questions they may have about the first arc? Oh, sounds great. Yeah, let's do that. Anybody who wants to, feel free to unmute and ask questions now. I know we had one question as to what language uh, these um, old uh, legends were in. Uh, largely old French, largely old French, uh, but not all of them survive in their original language. So some have been translated into German. Uh, not, no, many have been translated into German. Um, some have been translated into uh, Swedish. Uh, some are uh, in Italian that we have. Um, it's because these songs were popular all over Europe, they became, they were translated all over Europe uh, or adapted into local language. I mean, a, a chanson, a song written in Old French is not going to be a song in German. But remember that most of these people were highly multilingual at the time. Okay, other questions? Okay, well, uh, I will, let me go on to talk about the, the Charlemagne's court and the, the great figures of, of Carolingian legend. And I'll try and cover uh, at least the bones of uh, the earliest chanson I have uh, that's about them, okay? So everybody knows Charlemagne. Uh, who is the other figure that everyone knows? Roland. Obviously, it's Roland. Everyone knows Roland. Um, Roland probably existed. Uh, perhaps not as he was depicted in the uh, in legend. In fact, almost certainly not. Um, but in Carolingian legend, uh, he is the king's nephew. Uh, he is the first of the paladins. Um, the word paladin and our understanding of it comes from the, its use in Carolingian myth. Okay. Paladin comes from the word palatine. Okay, um, the paladins were known in legend as the twelve peers of France. Okay, so they were called the twelve palatines. The palatines were the hills around Rome on which Rome was built. So they were saying that these these warriors were the pillars on which the kingdom rested. Okay, so they called them. Palatines, and um, that was, not, you can't even say mistranslated, uh, borrowed into our language and became, evolved into, they were the Paladins rather than the Palatines. Um, and uh, 
So Roland was the king's nephew. Actually, there are uh, stories in which he's actually the, the, the Roland is the daughter of the king's sister. Roland is the son of the king's sister. Okay, so um, he's Charlemagne's nephew. There are also stories in which he was the king's son as well as his nephew. And when I read that, I'm like, well, that's not borrowing from a Thorian legend at all, is it? Um, but the more I read it, I thought, you know, there might be something to that. And, and not in the... Um, not in the purient respect, but we know Charlemagne had a lot of concubines. Um, he practiced concubinage. Well, what happens to a concubine who, I mean, because a conquering king will accumulate concubines kind of as a matter of the course of empire. Um, what happens to a concubine who would like to marry someone else. So what, what do you do with that? Just say no? Well, sometimes. But if you just kind of stumbled into this person who is a politically significant person of a culture you conquered, and the only thing to do with them, like, they've got to be your concubine. Otherwise, they're going to be a potential threat to your your continued reign over that culture group, right? Well, if you decide that you, if the two of you decide you're done, well, what would happen sometimes is that they would be formally adopted into the royal family as a sibling. Henry VIII did that. He dissolved one of his marriages to the fat one. I don't remember. Uh, he dissolved one of his marriages by saying, we're, we're, we're siblings now. She's my sister. She is a, a royal person. We're, we're not together anymore. What if he had done that? What if Charlemagne had done something civil, similar, gave one of his concubines to a trusted up and coming noble, said, you know what? She's my sister now but then they weren't quite done with each other? It could happen. The, the, the rumors of such, a, such an occurrence could have developed over time like a game of telephone and turned into uh, Roland secretly being the king's incestuous son. I, I like him better as his nephew. And that's, that's what most uh, most stories have Roland being. But, okay. He is the first of the paladins. He is, he is essentially Achilles. Okay? And if you've read the, Achi read the Iliad, you know that Achilles is a dick. He is, he is courageous to a fault. He is uh, if there is a, he will ride straight at anything, whether or not it's a good idea, but he's got so much prowess that it usually works okay anyway. That's, that's Roland. Um, the, uh, I think the, well, no, the, the oldest chanson talking about Roland is truly the Song of Roland. That is one of the oldest chansons that we have at all. Okay. The, the story about the battle at um, Longeville Pass is that caught in the knightly, the chivalric imagination. Um, okay, yeah. Let's talk about the Song of Roland. And the Song of Roland, to, it's, it definitely establishes Roland's character. So the idea is in legend that, now in real life, Charlemagne campaigned in Spain 
about 10 years into his reign. He suffered his only military defeat at Marshall Pass, but it was only about 10 years into his reign. In the legends, however, this is all the way at the end of Charlemagne's reign. Charlemagne is an emperor at this point, okay? When Charlemagne was crowned king of France, he was 26. When he was crowned emperor, he was like 56. Uh, no, 52, I think he was 52. Uh, and he died at 65, okay? So he was an emperor for a while, but at the very end of his life. Uh, Longchamp Pass happened when he was 36, okay? Uh, but doesn't matter. These are the legends, not real history. So legend has it that um, the petty kings, the petty Muslim kings of Spain were afraid of an army being raised by the, uh, the emir of Babylon. Not really, but okay. They were afraid of an army being raised by the emir of Babylon. So they wrote to Charlemagne and said, please come to Spain, make us your vassals, and we will give up Muhammad and take the cross. And uh, Charlemagne's like, sweet, yes, we will do this. And so he goes into uh, Spain, but the emir of Babylon has already arrived. And so all of the Muslim petty lords are like, deals off, deals off, we gotta be Muslims. Uh, and so they fight and they fight and they fight and they fight. And uh, Charlemagne has campaigned for seven years in Spain. And uh, finally, they are about to take the city of Sargossa. And so uh, the king of Sargossa sends a message and says, time out, peace, okay? We give up, um, we will give you gold, we'll give you hostages. Uh, just go away. You can be the king. We will follow you to your capital in Aachen, uh, which is on the border of the Rhine. Uh, it is on the German side of the Rhine, but that was Charlemagne's capital in Aachen. Uh, we will go, and then there we will be baptized, and we will become Christians. We will become your true followers. And um, all of the older generations, like this is that this is exactly what we wanted. This is all we wanted. Yes, this is good. And Roland is the lone voice that says, "No, the, these they're they're lying. They said this the first time. They're saying this now. They're they're liars. We're almost through the walls. Let's take the city by force and you know kill all of our enemies, and then we can go home." We don't go home with live enemies. Uh, but then he is, he, is, he is talked down by his father-in-law. Uh, his father-in-law is uh, Ganelon. Ganelon. Ganelon is someone else who has a lot of names. Uh, Ganelon was the Duke of Brittany. Uh, by marriage. Um, he is um, a fine warrior in his own respect. Um, he has led armies to victory. He has um, done much for Charlemagne. He has been at all points a, a loyal and capable vassal of the king. But he's Charlemagne, or he's Roland's stepfather. And Roland has hated him from the very beginning. He has been an absolute dick to Ganelon. Absolutely hates his guts, as many stepchildren do. Um, and so Ganelon says, you just want to fight. In fact, you've, say, you've taken several cities without Charlemagne's express permission. You just, you just want to fight. We've got an offer of peace. You should take the offer of peace. Okay, great. We'll take the offer of peace. The question is then, how do we, what, what, what are the terms of peace? And who goes and presents the terms of peace? 
to the king of Sargosa. So uh, Duke Nemo, Duke Naaman, says, I'll go. And the king's like, no, no, you are not going. Uh, they have executed our messengers before. You're not going. Archbishop Turpin, um, who is, uh, he is an archbishop and he is a belted knight. Uh, he never fights Christians, but Charlemagne isn't always fighting Christians. So Archbishop Turpin is right in there with him. Uh, and he is often listed as one of the, the paladins. Um, Turpin says, I'll go. And uh, Charlemagne is what, are you, are you crazy? You are a bishop. They will kill you. Uh, no, you can't go. And so Roland pipes up from the back and he says, how about Ganelon? You talked a good game when you thought uh, that somebody else would be delivering the message. How about you deliver the message yourself? And Ganelon is furious because this is like a threat on his life, right? This is, he is someone that the other side might like to kill. He has been a successful warrior against them. And now here's his bratty stepson pushing him off into risking his life. And this is the point at which his character changes. And he says, all right, yeah, I'll go. I'll go, but you'll regret it. You'll regret this for the rest of your life. And so he does. He goes to Sargosa and he delivers Charlemagne's terms. And Charlemagne had told the king of Sargosa that yes, uh, all of you can be can take the cross. You can become Christian. Uh, we will baptize you. We will not uh, take your possessions other than those you have offered us in uh, in payment for the secession of hostilities. Um, we will not, um, you know, we will not enslave you. You will become Christians like us. But you, King, personally. Are a dead man. You're going to come with us. We're going to behead you because you killed two ambassadors of ours. And so um, Ganelon delivers that message and he tells himself in the Chanson de Roland that as long as I have my sword, as long as they don't take my sword, I will not be afraid of dying cowardly. So they might kill him then and there, but he's like, at least I'm going to take some of them with me. So he delivers the message. And of course, the king is not best pleased. And Ganelon says, all right, that's the deal that Charlemagne gives you. I've got a deal of my own. You don't want Charlemagne here. We don't want to be here. Everybody else wants to go home. So go ahead give us your ransom, give us hostages, not you personally, tell us that, uh, in fact, you know what, I'll say that you died in a shipwreck fleeing the deal. Yeah, that's what I'll say. Uh, there's only one segment in Charlemagne's army that was really still wanting war, and that is Roland and the 12 peers behind him. So I tell you what you do. When we are crossing back into France, you set an ambush at Rancheville Pass. Take out the tail of the army. I'll make sure that they are the last in the army. You take them out. It'll be like cutting off Charlemagne's right arm and the, the, the pro-war faction of the, of the Franks will be no more and we'll, have, we'll all have what we want. So the plot was set. Um, Ganelon convinces Charlemagne that, all right, here's what they've said. They've given us these prisoners. He lies and says the king is dead. And uh, he says, to ensure the safety of our departure. We should have the strongest warriors, 12 peers and the 20,000 knights that they have with them as our rear guard. And to prevent us from being ambushed, we should have the 
to old great nobles. Old Year of the Dane, Duke Nemo, um, is there another one? Maybe Archbishop Turpin. Um, all of them at the vanguard of the army. And we will be here in the center with the hostages and the treasure. And uh, Roland seems to know that something's up, but everybody else is like, well, it, it's a good plan. It's, that's, that is a logical order of march. And so they pass from Spain into France. They're in the middle of the Pyrenees and uh, the, of course, the Muslim armies fall upon them with 100,000 men led by the pagan 12, 12, the 12 peers, what are they called? 12 pagan peers? Yeah, the, either the pagan 12 or the 12 pagan peers um, who were uh, great knights. Um, well, not knights. Uh, they make a they make a very clear distinction about that, not knights, um, of uh, men who can counter the 12 peers of France. And they have an epic battle of about 100 pages of poetry. No, it's actually about 80 pages. It's 100 pages overall, about 80 pages of poetry of, of lots of heroics. And ultimately, the peers begin falling one by one by one. And uh, Roland is, um, is, is unkillable, much like Achilles. You couldn't, you could lay a sword on him, you could injure him, he could have horrifying blows, but he wasn't, he wouldn't fall. At the beginning of the battle, he was caught, he was counseled by his best friend Oliver, blow the horn, Oliphant, an elephant hunting horn, blow the horn, and Charlemagne will hear, will hear us, and he'll turn the army around and will be saved. And he says, no pagan will ever make me blow my horn. And uh, they fight. And uh, again, Oliver says, sound the horn and Charlemagne will turn the army around and rush and we can catch the, the Saracens in a pincer. And no pagan will make me blow my horn. Look at, look at us, we're killing them by the dozens. Uh, for every man of ours that falls, we kill 10 of them. Uh, but the battle doesn't go well at all. Uh, well, actually it does. I mean, if you, look, if you talk about kill to death ratio, it goes fantastically. But uh, the, the 12 peers of France begin falling one by one by one by one. And eventually it is only, uh, uh, it's only Roland and Oliver and Archbishop Turpin who are left alive at all. And they're caught in a, in a narrow defile where they're able to hold them off and Oliver dies and Roland uh, rushes out into the, the throng of men and is able to grab the bodies, the 12 peers of France, and grabs them and pulls them back so that Archbishop Turpin, who is himself killing like a madman, is able to give them um, a benediction and, 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 and bless them. They give them last rites, but they're, I don't know if they're grievously wounded or already dead says they're dead. Last rites after you're dead, I'm not sure is a thing, but give them funerary rites. And eventually, when it is only uh, Roland and Archbishop Turpin left, um, Roland faints. And the battlefield is, is largely quiet, and Archbishop Turpin uh, takes his helmet, and he goes to a uh, a rivulet to gather water in his helmet to bring it back to to give succor to Roland and he dies from blood loss still holding the water that was intended for Roland and Roland eventually wakes up and sees that the battlefield is uh, is is empty of living men and he said he finally grabs the horn olifant and he blows a burst of the horn. And Charlemagne hears it, but he hears it only faintly. He says to the people who surround him, did you hear, did you hear a horn? And Ganelon says, no, no, he didn't hear anything. And so Roland blows again, harder. And this time it can be 
faintly heard by everyone. So everyone begins to hear the horn. And Charlemagne says, that sounded like Oliphant. And Gamelon says, no, no, couldn't, it couldn't have been. And Roland blows a third blast. He blows it harder than anyone has ever blown it before. And essentially, he gives himself an aneurysm. He, he ruptures his internal organs and bleeds from the temples and the nose. And he blows it so hard that the blast can be heard for 20 miles in every direction, as clear as a bell. And Charlemagne looks at Gamelon and says, what have you done? And they turn the army around, and there is very little left to be done. Uh, and then uh, Gamelon is taken back, uh, and he is put on trial. He is, uh, he makes the argument that, well, yes, I betrayed Roland, but that was, that was personal vengeance. It was not treason. You can't, you can't execute me for that. And he had a lot of friends and they said, yeah, I think it was. And um, the older uh, prominent people in Charlemagne's court were acting as judges. So although they disagreed, they could not take a side personally. And it was the, um, I think the young Duke of Tours who said, no, you're a liar and I'll prove it. And he engages in judicial combat with one of Ganelon's followers. And Ganelon's follower is the stronger fighter, but um, heaven takes a hand and will not allow this injustice to be done. And so the young Archbishop of Tours is able to defeat his opponent, and Ganelon is executed by uh, being uh, drawn and burst apart between four horses. And that's the Chanson de Roland. The, uh, in French, it is common when hearing a recitation of the Chanson to finish by saying, Merci Roland. Uh, thank you, Roland, for um, what you did for France and Christendom. Um, and so that is the oldest chanson we have of, of any of this at all. Um, but uh, it really sets Roland's character. Um, but as you will see in many other it, it, over and over and over again, the the later medieval people heard this and were like, "That's awesome!" Now, what else did he do? He died. That that's that's it. That's the end. That's all there is. They're like, "That can't be it. There must be more." And so, you have more songs about other things that Roland did. And one of the things that he did was he met his best friend Oliver, and this kind of might have actually happened. Uh, the oldest song that we have of Roland meeting Oliver is uh, Roland is like 12, 12 years old. He, there is uh, the, the Lord of Vienne, not Vienna, Vienne, the city in southern France. Uh, he was a, a count or a duke, I don't remember which, um, and he decided that he had had enough of Charlemagne. So you know what? Um, my grandfather conquered this city from the pagans himself. I hold my this city by right of my descent from him, not by right of being given it by Charlemagne. This is my city. I'm not going to do what you say anymore. Screw you. And Charlemagne took umbrage to that, and he decided to siege the city. Uh, Roland as a like a 12 year old goes off to war to join the siege uh, he is he's so little that he is not able to wear his sword around his waist because of drag on the ground so he takes a sword belt and wears it like a baldric around his neck so that he can actually draw his sword without it you know dangling around behind him but years into the siege um, both Charlemagne and the Lord of Vienne are like, this has gone on about long enough. How about we settle this 
with single combat. So Vienne is a city on the Rhone River. Uh, I could even, you can find the Rhone in France. Uh, it's, a, it's a city on the river. And so they said, okay, we will go to, uh, we will send both men out and uh, onto a river in the middle of the Rhone and they'll fight to the death. And whoever wins, uh, that's who wins. Okay? Okay. And so Roland immediately volunteers, like, me. And all of uh, the Duke of Vienne's nephew, Oliver, also volunteered, me. And this has gone on for years. So they're uh, 16, 17-ish. And the oldest chanson actually goes that the Duke of Vienne and Charlemagne were like, but you might die. So they decided rather than actually send the youths out where these, these treasured kinsmen might die, the old men decided to make peace instead. That's the, how the original song goes. It's so cool. Uh, but later so chansons are like, so you just shake hands and that's it? That's, that's, not, a, that's not a war story. So later chansons have Roland and Oliver uh, go out to an island on the middle of the Rhone. There they will do single combat to the death. And because it is a judicial combat, they decide that uh, they will be armored identically. So they get mashed suits of mail, mashed helmets, mashed weapons, mashed everything. Um, and you know it's distributed between them. And so they wear armor that is not um, uh, not recognizable to anyone. So Roland and Oliver, uh, they charge at each other and they unhorse each other uh, they, because they break these saddle girths. And so they go on to go in foot combat and uh, with, they, they split their shields and they fight with a sword in both hands. And eventually their helmets are both knocked off and they see that it is, that Oliver sees that it's Roland and Roland sees that it's Oliver and uh, being uh, sworn brothers already at this time, Oliver says, uh, I am defeated. And Roland says, I yield me at the same time in the embrace. And because the two combatants have simultaneously yielded, uh, Charlemagne and the Duke of Vienne, uh, their hands are tied. So, well, I guess we're just going to have to make peace because our combatants did it for us. So that's probably not how that actually went, but it's a good story. And that's the story of Roland and Oliver. Um, initially, in the earliest chanson, Roland and Oliver did not know each other. And because of their, their elder relatives' compromise, they encouraged them to become sworn brothers. And that was the start of their friendship. That actually seems a lot more reasonable to me. But in the later chansons, Roland and Oliver had been fostered together. They'd grown up together. They were best friends. And so uh, having been drawn into this conflict on opposite sides, that's why uh, their, their, their great friendship for each other was able to resolve the larger conflict. So that's Oliver. Um, we know Roland, we know Oliver. An another name that you might know is Renault or Renaud de Montebon. Um, to, yeah, to the Germans, he was Renault. Um, Renault, he is one of, his sh earliest chanson was one of the third cycle of rebellious lords, okay? Renault was one of the four sons of Amon. Uh, Amon of Dordogne, uh, Dordogne is a f fictional location in the Ardennes. Um, there is now a place named Dordogne uh, near uh, near Montauban. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll get into this later. Uh, let me tell you the, the story first. Um, Ammon had four sons, Renaud, uh, Renault, Rickard, uh, I don't, 
I don't remember his two other brothers. But anyway, the four brothers. And Amon takes them to the court of Charlemagne to be introduced to the king. And um, it initially goes very well because Reynolds wins a tournament that he has there. And uh, Roland is present and not, com not competing, but he compliments Reynolds uh, very highly. And he says, that's fantastic. And so they are being celebrated in uh, Charlemagne's Hall. And Reynolds is invited to a chess game with uh, Charlemagne's either son or nephew, it happens both ways, um, named Bertolai. And Reynolds wins. And Bertolai is a bratty son of a bitch. He says, Reynolds, you were a cheater. You couldn't have possibly beaten me honest or beaten me honestly. He picks up the chessboard and he flings it into his face. And so Reynolds has been, he has been defamed and he has been insulted. So he draws his sword and he splits Bertolai's head open. Just casually kills the king's nephew and or son. This may have been somewhat impolitic. Uh, you know the, the Robert E. Howard quote that like civilized men are more discourteous than savages because they know they can be impolite with having their skulls split as a general thing? That's that's Reynolds. So uh, Reynolds has this magical horse named Bayard. And either he won it in the tournament, and that is how it occurs in the oldest chanson, uh, but Bayard is a magical shape-shifting horse which can uh, accommodate all four brothers on his back at once and is able to run so, so powerfully that he can leap walls, leap castle walls, leap valleys, and that's how they escape Charlemagne's court because Charlemagne is justifiably pissed. His nephew and or son has just been murdered. And so uh, Reynolds and his four brothers, uh, they uh, decide to hide in the Ardennes where... Uh, they either find a castle named uh, Montresor uh, on a peak overlooking the river, or in other later versions, their cousin uh, named Magus, who is a belted knight and a sorcerer because he was raised by the fairy lady Oriand. <laughs> uh, he just magics the fortress into existence overnight. Um, so yeah, now we have now we have sorcerers who are knights running around in Charlemagne's court because it's the Middle Ages and it's cool. Um, and Charlemagne goes and he sieges the castle and uh, knocks it down with catapults, and the brothers flee to the uh, the south of France in the Pyrenees, where they set up another castle named uh, Montauban. And uh, in the original chanson, Charlemagne goes there, sieges it. He's about to, uh, you know, break into the castle. And Roland goes to Charlemagne and pleads on behalf of the valorous knights and says, please make peace. And Char Charlemagne says, all right, I will pardon you, except you, Reynolds. You have to go on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and you have to give me Bayard. And they, he ties a millstone around Bayard's neck and throws him into uh, the River Rhone where Bayard either dies or escapes into the Ardennes and becomes a wild horse and a legend there. And Reynolds uh, travels to Jerusalem where he is successful in uh, seeing uh, the great holy places of Christianity and then dies as a pilgrim. That's it. And then medieval people later were like, but that can't be it. But that, it can't just end like that. So what do we get? Retcons. So um, uh, Magus, the, the sorcerer, becomes a, uh, a much greater part, and he furnishes Reynolds with fortresses and weapons, and uh, uh, the castle Montauban becomes a refuge for 
uh, knights who were unjustly uh, accused of wrongdoing or cast out of Charlemagne's court or disinherited by uh, the predatory actions of other nobles. And so there's this fortress in the Ardennes, which is uh, kind of a cross between a, a, a fortress against Islam in the south and also a bandit fortress and it's cool and they're like mercenaries and it's awesome. And uh, he goes on many other adventures because medieval people were not willing to let the character go just like that. That's what I mean. Um, and Bayard becomes, oh my gosh, Bayard the horse. I cannot overemphasize how big of a deal Bayard became. There were knights, great knights in French history who were named Bayard after the horse. Okay, so uh, he's like, who is the most famous horse in our our culture? What like Sea Biscuit, Man of War, Black Beauty, maybe Bayard. The the only comparable comparable equine figure I can think of is like Shadowfax. Okay, from from the Legends of Tolkien. Um, but uh, Bayard was huge. Um, but re the story of the Four Sons of Amen actually created history as we know it now. Because the fortress of Montauban was not a place. Montauban is Mont Alban or Mont Alban. Um, the Alban or Mount Alban, the Alban Hills were, th that was the, the hills around Rome. Uh, like, Romulus and Remus were Albans. Uh, Julius Caesar, uh, the Scipii, maybe even the Gracchi were all of Alban descent. So Mount Alban is like saying Mount Roman. So if this place ever actually existed, it would probably be a, uh, a hilltop with a Roman, a ruined Roman fortress on it. Okay. But later people didn't care about that. There's just this Montauban. That's awesome. Where is Montauban? Well, we don't have one. Except after the Albigensian Crusade, when the Catholics burnt the southern third of France down to the ground to get rid of the Cathars, uh, Raymond of Toulouse, who was not himself a Cathar, uh, but fought for them, fought defending them during the peace, uh, as a, he was allowed to build new cities, new scratch-built cities called the Bastides. Or Bastides? But I don't know. Looks like Bastides to me. It's a scratch-built city, and it was not allowed to be fortified. And so, one of the scratch-built cities that he set up, he named Montauban. So there is a Montauban, France, now. There was not in any of the time where this had happened or previous to that, but Raymond of Toulouse was a fan of Renaud de Montauban, and so he started a city named after it. So that's how a figure from Northern France became named after a city in Southern France. Um, let's see, who else should I talk about? Um, uh, oh, Ogier the Dane. Yes, Ogier the Dane is a fascinating figure because we think he actually existed, um, sort of. The oldest chanson we have about Ogier the Dane is that um, Ogier was a, he was a pagan. Um, and fought sh against Charlemagne in several battles as Charlemagne was conquering the Germanies. Um, during one of those battles, Ogier's son was slain by Charlemagne. Perhaps not directly, but certainly in, in the battles. So Ogier, um, 
went on a personal vendetta against Charlemagne. He warred with him for seven years, up and down the, the Rhine River, all across and back and forth. And eventually, because Charlemagne was militarily successful, Ogre and uh, his band took refuge in the kingdom of Lombardy in northern Italy. And um, Charlemagne uh, followed them there and warred on the, the kingdom of Lombardy and actually conquered it. Ogier was caught. Um, he uh, actually accepted the cross at that point, became a Christian, and was nevertheless held as a prisoner. Remained a prisoner for seven years until, until there was a Saracen raid on Rome or Lombardy. It's we're not sure. Um, and so uh, Charlemagne sends out, uh, who, who does he send? He sends out, uh, oh, I don't remember. Um, he, he, I, can't, I can't find it. He sends, I think he sends out Oliver. He sends out Guy de Berg, uh Guy de Bourgogne, Bur Bur Guy de Bourgogne, Guy de Bourgogne. He sends out uh, another a couple of minor figures, and they're all smashed by the Saracen champions. And um, Charlemagne is running short on available champions. And Ogier the Dane, even though he's a captive, is there, and it's like, just send me out. You know that I'm a capable fighter, and so Charlemagne does, and. Um, uh, I think the uh, Ogier the Dane kills a Saracen giant and uh, wins, the, wins the day and uh, he and Charlemagne are reconciled. And so he, because of his great prowess and having converted to Christianity, he very quickly becomes one of Charlemagne's inner circle. And he is referenced as one of the older generation of great knights. Um, Frequently, all the time. Um, but Ogier? Ogier? What, what, what kind of a name is that? Odd Gear. If in English, it would be Edgar. It would be his, that was his name. He was Edgar, Odd Gear. But Odd Gear, the Germanic name, does not roll off the French tongue. So, Odd Gear? Ogier, Ogier. So, oh, so it, it's written down as Ogier. Funnily enough, when that name was brought into or back to, you know, Germany or to Denmark or to Scandinavia, they had just as much problem at, with Ogier speaking with their Germanic or Scandinavian tongues. And so they changed it to Ogier. Holger, Holger, Holger. He became Holger Dansky. If they just went back to his original name, Oddgear, it would have been just fine. But so he went from Oddgear to Ogier to Holger because going back and forth, the, the name doesn't work well. It's like translating something into Chinese and then translating it back to English and trying to read it. Um, it's the linguistics are kind of like that. Um, <clears throat> so, Ogier the Dane had a very special sword. It was named Kirtana. A lot of famous characters had special swords with names. Um, Charlemagne had a sword named Joyous. Archbishop Turpin had a sword named Almes, which um, the, the etymology is disputed. It is probably from the word alms, or rather the Germanic version of that word. The, like giving alms, alms for the poor. Um, so uh, essentially they were saying the sword was um, a charitable mercy, I guess. Um, the, uh, the other etymology is that it comes with it from, uh, from Almighty. Um, Ogier had Kirtana, uh, which is uh, 
it means it's short. And of course, Roland has Durandal. And the origins of these swords are all over the place. It's one of the reasons I love all of these legends because sometimes the, they came like in, in the Song of Roland, it says, let me, let me read it to you. Durandal was handed to Charlemagne personally by an angel. Um, it, was, uh, it was said to contain within the golden hilt a tooth of St. Peter, blood of Basil of Caesarea, hair of St. Denis. Uh, St. Denis is the patron saint of France. Uh, a piece of the raiment of Mary, mother of Jesus, and to be the sharpest sword in all existence. Like, wow! Um, in another legend, which I love, Durandal, Almace, and Kirtana were provided to Charlemagne by a Jewish merchant. Uh, the, this merchant says, so he goes to Charlemagne, he's like, look, you are sieging the castle of a rebellious lord. My brother is held as a prisoner by this rebellious lord. So if you would, I have these three fantastic swords forged by Wayland the Smith, the best smith who ever was. I have no purpose for them, for I am a humble merchant. If you would take these and free my brother, I would be ever so, so, um, so grateful. So Charlemagne takes them, they're really good swords, he frees the merchant's brother. The merchant is never actually written out to be Jewish, but his name is Mordecai, and his brother's name is Abraham. So, so three of the most famous swords in Carolingian legend were provided by a Jewish arms merchant. I love it! <laughs> David, we've got a question here about book recommendations. Can you make mm -hmm. any book recommendations for uh -huh. any of these? Yes, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> don't do it the way I did it. The way I got into this was I started translating a 15th century proto-novel um, called uh, The Lion of Bruges or Herzog Herpen. And I, I stumbled into, I, I didn't know it was Carolingian legend at all. I just and then I found out that it was. And I'm like, who the heck are these people? And so I start researching and researching and researching. And I, uh, I, I wound up with the Carl Magnus, Magnus saga. The Carl Magnus saga was three books written or uh, translated uh, and published in the early 1970s. I own two of them. I have a digital copy of the third. And if anyone has a copy of the third, I will pay way more then I really ought to, to actually get my hands on a physical copy of the book. Like, my wife would kill me if she found out. Um, but I really, really want it. And it's fabulous because it's a direct translation of what is actually in the Scandinavian legends. If you want to read that, it is available digitally. I'll try and post a link maybe in the, the, um, in the class description. Um, so that is fabulous. That's what I'm working from primarily. But it's kind of a slog. Um, it's also out of print and you're going to have to pay north of 50 bucks, well north of 50 bucks. Actually, I got the $50 copies. You're going to have to pay probably twice that, sorry, um, if you want those. But Thomas Bullfinch, have you ever heard of Bullfinch's mythology? Thomas Bullfinch did Legends of Charlemagne, and it's still in print, and you can get it on Amazon cheap. I also think, because it's, uh, it's, it's old enough, uh, I think it's digitally available for free as well. And Bullfinch did a fantastic job. The thing that I object about Bullfinch is that, um, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a choice, it's a choice. I, and I wouldn't have made that choice, it's hardly an objection, but okay. So, there are the chansons, okay? These are, these are heroicized history of things that happened in the past, okay? 
So the chansons were not written contemporaneous to Charlemagne. They were written a couple hundred years later because people realized that cool stuff had been done by great men in the past. And they wrote songs about it because some of them stuck in their mind. And so they are the chansons. Uh, the later, uh, about the 12th century, uh, there is, uh, actually it was Huan of Bordeaux, the, the chanson of Huan of Bordeaux, was the, tra the transition between heroicized history to the, uh, the what's this called, the, like the Roman adventure, uh, adventure, romance adventures, yeah, the, the medieval romances. And romance does not necessarily mean like, I love you, I love you, I love you. Um, the romances were named because Rome is the light. Rome fell and part of the light of mankind was dimmed by its falling. And the people in the successor kingdoms recognized that what they had was not as great as what had come before. And so they wrote stories longing for the glory of Rome. And that longing um, and the, the things that they talked about, the great things of the past, that genre of talking about the past was called romance. And so in English, we have taken that word to, to only mean the longing for someone you love. That's romantic writing as we understand it now. But the heroic romances were the longing for the glory of the great deeds of the past. Okay, so that's what the medieval romances were. And there's a big transition because in the chansons, these are, this is stuff that happened. It's like the Iliad. Like, did Diomedes go on a killing spree and kill 65 men in one afternoon? Probably not. But was there a Diomedes and did he kill people? Probably. I mean, there was probably an Odysseus. I mean, we, we think we found the grave of Agamemnon, although probably didn't. But the, some of the names are corroborated in other places. Um, however, in the romances, you get you get towers of illusion. You get sorcerers who are belted knights. Mogus was basically the first. Well, he wasn't a battle mage. It was more like maybe a spell sword in modern D and D terms. Um, but you get rings of invisibility. You get uh, potions of love potions, hate potions, potions of forgetting. Uh, you get um, mental domination. You get uh, rings that can free people from mental domination. You get all of the, many of the, the, the things that built the modern fantasy genre in these medieval romances. Okay? You don't have people casting fireballs. You don't have people throwing bolts of lightning. But you do have uh, people enchanting boats to row themselves across the world. You have, uh, I, oh, it's a trip. It's a trip. Uh, we're running towards the end of my time here. Um, so I'm not going to go into um, Should I go into Orlando for your curioso? Why not? We've talked about a, a few of the key characters. So Okay, there were the the chansons and then they developed into the romances. The first romance um, actually, the first romance was called um, Huon of uh, ba, 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 Huon of Bordeaux. This guy was not a historic figure. Like Ogier the Dane was Odgir or, or, or Ofgirius. There was a historic figure. We we're pretty sure who that was. Roland was Hrudland, Count Hrudland. Um, uh, Charlemagne obviously existed. Uh, Renaud de Montauban, well, did he exist? Maybe the story, the older stories are actually um, credible, maybe. Uh, you, you could believe that something like that happened. Um, Huon or Bordeaux is someone, he's basically a Renault clone. 
he goes to the court of Charlemagne, he kills Charlemagne's son, Charlotte, I think. Um, and he is given reprieve from death on the condition that he go to the Holy Land and complete a number of impossible tasks. He's got to travel to the court of Babylon, uh, come back with the emir of Babylon's uh, beard and his teeth and slay the emir's mightiest knight and kiss the emir's daughter, Esclaramond, three times and then he will be um, pardoned. And he accomplishes these because he's best buddies with the fairy king Oberon. So that probably didn't happen. Um, but that was the, the transition from heroicized history to romance. And the romance is culminated in a pair of works called Orlando Innamorato and Orlando Furioso. And yeah, that's probably a good way to, to end the class talking about those. So <clears throat> the story is uh, that Roland, uh, no, Charlemagne decides to hold a tournament of the mightiest knights in the world that is open to Christians and pagans both. And so Saracens go, all of the mightiest knights of France go, people from King Arthur's court go, people from King Arthur's court go. King Arthur's was supposed to have happened 400 years earlier. It's supposed to have been a completely different generation. But the later, and actually, yes, uh, Ogier the Dane's sword, Kratana, was supposed to have been the sword of Tristram. You know, Tristram and Isolde? Um, Tristram was, was marked for death, actually, because he defeated uh, a king's champion by splitting his helmet, and the end of his sword actually got caught in his helmet and skull and broke off. And so Tristram had a shortened sword. And he was actually identified as the killer of that champion by the champion's sister who kept the peace and was able to point him out as the killer and then marked him for death and the, the tragedy proceeds. <clears throat> Kurtana, that sword, then became the sword of Ogier the Dane. Uh, ignore the other, ignore from the Jewish arms merchant, ignore it coming as made as a set with Joyous and Durandal. It's It was also said to be Tristan's sword. That sword then went back to England to become the sword of Edward the Confessor, which is now used in uh, the British coronation ceremony. How cool is that? Sword of Ogier the Dane made Queen Elizabeth sovereign of England. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, so uh, knights coming from all over the place. And so Roland is there, his cousin Reynolds is there, his cousin Reynolds. Yes, Chansons later on decided that uh, Reynolds was way too cool to be just a nobody. So they made him Roland's cousin. Yep, because retconning. It's, this, is, it, this is like comic book history stretched out over five centuries. You wouldn't believe the kind of crazy contradictory stuff that you have to sift through to try and get a, 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 feel, for, a feel for what happened. Oh, and that's what my objection to Bullfinch, because Bullfinch took all of the stories that he could and tried to make a cohesive literary work out of them. And you really can't unless you significantly edit it and do like a, a, a Mort de Arthur out of it. But Bullfinch didn't. He's just like this story and 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 this story. And, this story. and they all happened. Yes. <laughs> but but they don't fit. They don't fit together. Um, so I want to early on. Bullfinch starts with Orlando Inamorato and Orlando Furioso by adapting these stories. So big tournament. Um, then the most beautiful woman that anybody has ever seen shows up at the tournament along with her brother, a knight named. Uh, her name is Angelica. Uh, she's a pagan from Cathay. Yeah, China. 
No, actually, the, the, they, they give a geography. Um, he was saying Cafe was a city in like west of, or east of Kiev, so probably in Kazakhstan somewhere. That's, that's where it's supposed to happen. That's where she came from because it's later on sieged by Tartars. And if you hope to have any semblance of actual geography in these works, you will be, it will be painful how, uh, how quickly and brutally you will be disappointed. Because I've tried to set the chansons into the timeline that actually happened and that does not work. And I've tried to set it into the geography that actually exists, and that does not work. And it is what it is. Um, so everybody wants this lady, Angelica. And she says, you can have me. Any one of you can have me as long as you defeat my brother, um, this knight who is in disguise. And he has a magical lance. He has a magical cheat lance, which lets him... Um, blow anyone out of the saddle as long as he touches them with the lance. So he defeats a number of knights early on. And then there is this giant named Farragut, um, who was a Saracen that Oliver killed. But ignore that, he's still alive. Uh, uh, Farragut, he jousts against Farragut and uh, Farragut uh, is unhorsed, but he's furious. And so he draws his sword. And just like the mountain in Game of Thrones, he splits uh, Angelica's brother's horse in half with his sword. And then he falls on him and tears his head off. And Angelica's like, that was not the plan. And so she flees with the ring of invisibility. And all of the knights are like, well, he defeated her brother. She's fair game. Let's go! And so all of the knights in this tournament decide to just travel off into the hinterlands of, of Western Asia, I guess, in search of this lady with a ring of invisibility. And uh, all, all kinds of nonsense happens. Oh, the, they, let's see, Angelica and Reynolds. Um, unknowingly wind up in uh, near the fountain of fountain of love and the fountain of hate, which were the the sources of the potions, the two potions that caused so much trouble for Tristram and Isolde. Okay, because remember Tristram uh, liked Isolde, but uh, Isolde uh, was unhappy going into her arranged marriage, and so her nursemaid had gotten a potion of love uh, so that she would fall madly in love with her husband, and a potion of hate so that she would give up on Tristram. And so uh, Tristram is sold knowing that uh, their love cannot be, they decide to console each other by drinking. And so uh, is sold is like, I found the good stuff in my nursemaid's uh, steamer chest and she doesn't know I got it. What, what do you say we split it? That's actually the potion of love and they fall madly in love and the tragedy unfolds uh, thereafter. And so they actually run into the physical place where these two uh, springs have arisen. And um, Reynolds camps by the fountain of hate and he doesn't realize that it just looks like clear water to him and he drinks it. It doesn't taste any different, it's just water. He lays down and goes to sleep. Angelica uh, winds up near the fountain of love and so she drinks it, and it's just pure water to her, as far as she knows. And then uh, they, she wakes up, and uh, she's wandering around, around the lake, and she sees Reynolds. But she's drunk from the fountain of love, and so she falls madly in love with the first person she sees, Reynolds. So she wakes him up by dropping flower petals on his face because she's never been in love before and doesn't know how this is supposed to work. And Reynolds wakes up and sees Angelica, but he is drunk from the fountain of hate, and absolutely despises her and runs off. And the, uh, oh gosh, I, I'm not even sure I can recount the nonsense that happens afterwards. Uh, 
Let's see. And you recommend a good source for the whole story. Oh yeah, they're published. They're published. You can find Orlando uh, Orlando Inamorato. That's it. So Roland became uh, Rolando became Orlando. So Roland is Orlando, and uh, Renault uh, or Renaud became Ronaldo. I think he is still yeah. It's Orlando and Ronaldo, uh, and. Uh, they go through lots of hijinks together. And oh, a figure out of Carolingian legend that I thought I would be most inclined to talk about tonight was Bradamante, the, the female knight. And I, I looked her up, and it turns out she is a creation of the writer of uh, Orlando in Amorato, so Roland in Love. And she was to be. She was Roland's, or no, she was Reynolds' sister, the sister uh, Bradamante. Now, when you read some of these romances, it's almost like reading an allegory because the names are not subtle. Uh, Bradamante is from the two Italian words, brado, which means wild, and amante, which means lover. She is the wild lover because she is a knight, but she's also fated to fall in love with the Saracen or half Saracen knight Rugario and be uh, the cause of his salvation and conversion to Christianity. Oh, <clears throat> that's a big feature in uh, in both the chansons and the romances is the conversion to Christianity is a big feature. They, they truly believed that um, Christians were supposed to be fishers of men. And as long as there was anyone who, was, who denied Christ, okay, they were the enemies of Christendom, and we fight. But the second that you accept, uh, accept the cross, accept that, you know, accept the divinity of Christ and are baptized, then all Christian knights were to see converted Saracens as their immediate brothers. Okay, so there was, there was this, um, like, these were not, the, the, the chivalry that you see here is not something that we can wrap our heads around. Like, the, the people in the chansons were barbarians, and the people who wrote the romances were only one step removed. Like, we are citizens. Okay, we are, we make our living by being industrious with our labor or our, our mental aptitude and people compensate us for the usefulness that we provide to them with what we offer. These people were warriors who gained their goods by killing them and taking them from other people. Okay, so uh, like all of the wonderful items that we see in um, like, like Durandal. There was no quest to get Durandal. Somebody just gave it to Roland because he was the best person for it. Um, the, the dude with the magic lance who uh, was able to unhorse anybody and then Farragut got pissed and just killed his horse and killed him with a sword. That wasn't the plan with the magic lance. Well, the magic lance was just picked up by the knight Astolfo, who's another knight that I would love to tell you about, um, but we probably don't have time. Like, they just picked up stuff. They found it. Or if it was sitting in the woods unattended, they would just take it because finders keepers, I guess. So they, their mores were very, very different from ours. Even though we practice chivalry or some version of it, it was not what is depicted there. Um, but something that they did do is even as, as brutal as they were, you know, kill them, loot the body. Um, as someone says, if, if a, a, a pagan or a Saracen says, um, I accept Christ, then it's your job to go get water, baptize them, and say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are now my brother in Christ. 
let's go to a church and get you catechized. But seriously, they like there's a a a, uh, uh, a, a depiction of um, of Roland fighting a uh, the the king of the Tartars, and they're they're laying on their back at night discussing philosophy, and Roland is talking about uh, Christ and the and God who created the universe, and the Tartar is like, uh, I, I am a Muslim because I get to have more wives than you do. We and have a question I, here of how do you spell that name? Grotamonte? Uh, Bradamante, B-R-A-D-A-M-A-N-T-E, or Bradamant. Um, uh, and so Ruggiero is, is this fine Saracen, half Saracen warrior. And um, for love of Bradamante, he's like, uh, well, I, I love you. And Bradamante says, I love you too, but we cannot marry if you are a pagan. He's like, for you, I will do anything and I'll take the cross. And um, so then he gets dragged into the court of Charlemagne because, because the prodigal son has returned and that's how they treated it. And you know what? I don't think that was as, that's not as far off as we might be inclined to think of it now. Um, the religions and the cultures that are, were built by them have very much solidified. But at the time, there were, there were liminal places. Like out in Asia, you would get the Tartars who, um, they they chose to be Muslim because they could have many wives, but then they would trade with the Rus and then maybe retire as a Rus um, once they've gotten all gotten all that out of the system, and then they can become a Christian and they can drink alcohol. And um, they they were like the Basques. Oh, I was going to talk about the Basques. So the Basques, the Battle of Rochefort Pass was 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 pissed off Basques falling on the tail end of Charlemagne's army and wiping it out. The Basques, Given that we've only got another minute or two here. Oh, okay. Why don't you schedule another class in January to talk about the Basques? We've well, got plenty of teaching time. That's probably a good idea. But I, I do want to say that there were there were places where where it was culturally acceptable to change teams, depending on what you needed or what the other team was offering, or maybe because you were just done sinning or you were at the end of your life and you thought that like the narrative of Islam or the narrative of Christianity was compelling, but I'm a pagan and I get to do a lot of things that they don't like. So why don't I get all of that done? And then, and then I can be baptized or then I can, can become a follower of, uh, of the one true faith and 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 changing teams was not as it was offensive to the the team that you left but it was not seen as it was more accepted in some places like you couldn't do that in Egypt you couldn't do that in France, but maybe out past Ukraine, you could. In, uh, in the Pyrenees, it, as a Basque, you could, because the Basques were playing the Christians off of the Muslims, off of the pagans. And there were Basque Muslims, there were Basque Christians, there were Basque pagans, and they were all Basque. That's, that's how they kept um, the Pyrenees for themselves. And on the Spanish side, the Muslims lived on the Spanish side. And the Muslim Basques interacted with the Muslim Spanish. They were like, we're all Muslims here. And on the Christian side, at, towards Gascony, that's where the Christian Basques lived. And they're like, we're all Christians here. And the pagans lived in the middle. And when Charlemagne plowed his way through and burned Basque villages because they're pagans and they're Muslims, the Basques are like, we're not having that, and fell upon them. And so it was a defeat by, it was, it was unthinkable that it was a defeat inflicted by Christians or just ordinary pagans, right? Um, and then you get some, um, some, the, the villain appropriate to the, the day at hand, 
right? Uh, it, by the 12th century, there weren't Vikings anymore. We don't care about those particular non-Christians. We're still very much caring about the non-Christians to the south of the Mediterranean that are um, uh, inflicting piracy on our maritime trade. So, okay, I still have a lot more to talk about. I guess I probably will schedule another one of these classes. We'll talk about Orlando and Amarato and Orlando Furioso and maybe a few of the other uh, secondary and tertiary characters of the mythology. But um, I have I have loved digging into this mythology and uh, I'm so happy that I get to share it with some of you because we as English speakers get to experience the matter of Britain as part of our cultural heritage. And we experience the matter of Rome because the ancient epics have been translated for us and are available at our fingertips. But the matter of France is still reasonably impenetrable. And I think it's important that we who play a game that is based off of the chivalric culture that was developed by these stories should know a little bit more about it. So thank you very much. I appreciate your attendance. I thank you so much for your patience. And I hope to see you again in a month or two.